Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the first session of International Coaching Week. My name is Aparna Ramesh K, and I'm honored to be your host today. I'd also like to introduce my co-host Nisha George and Gauri Kacherikar. She is managing our chat box. Together and on behalf of ICF Pune chapter, we extend warm welcome to all of you. We have an exciting program lined up all day, so ensure you're registered for second and third sessions as well. Uh, the link to both the sessions is shared uh, now in the chat box. Uh, ICW 2021 is our flagship global event that began on Monday 17th and will end tomorrow the 22nd of May. The purpose of this week-long annual event is to educate public about the value of working with professional coach and acknowledging the results and progress made through pro coaching process. ICF Pune chapter is proud to present the theme, Democratizing Coaching for a Thriving Society. I now invite our president, Jayashree Kirtane, to share the idea behind this theme. Over to you, Jayashree. Thanks. Thanks, Aparna. And uh, friends, uh, as Aparna mentioned, our today's theme is Democratizing uh, Coaching for a Thriving Society. Uh, I think all of us have experienced that the word coaching carries with it a lot of myths. And today we attempt to bust one of those myths. And that is coaching and being coached is a prerogative of only a handful fortunate few. Today we explore the question, is it possible to transcend the boundaries of uh, ethnicities, of corporate hierarchies, of economic stratas, of language, of age, through coaching language? Imagine if we can really crack this what we have in front of us is only a world full of abundant possibilities. So, uh, you know, let me uh, hand it over to uh, Aparna to take you through the agenda and also then later introduce the speakers who have spent years in making coaching accessible to the community. Thanks. Thanks, Aparna. Thank you so much, Jayashree. Friends, this is what we will do today. We have three stellar speakers who will be talking on various aspects of today's theme. Post that, we will have an exciting co-creation time and follow that up with Q&A. Also, if a thought or a question comes up for any of you, do drop it in the chat box. We want to keep it lively. We will pick and discuss them later in the session. Although the session ends in 90 minutes, we are extending this time by another 20 minutes for open networking. This is not mandatory, but since we have such a diverse audience, if anyone wants to meet and network with others, then this is an opportunity for them. With that, I now request Nisha to go ahead and introduce our speakers. Thanks, Aparna. Our first speaker this morning is Janine Bailey. Janine is a master certified coach, a coach mentor, a certified coach supervisor, and also a coach trainer amongst a number of other related credentials. She's also the pillar head coaching excellence for ICF Australasia. Janine has experience working with multinational blue chip companies and influential organizations in Qatar, UK, and Australia. As director and co-founder of Empower World in Qatar, Janine and her business partner, Marie Quigley, have coached, trained, and supported thousands of coaches and leaders from all around the world, including both indigenous and expat communities. Janine is passionate about teaching the skills of coaching, leadership, building relationships, and effective communication. She also supports organizations and individuals to achieve their objectives by working with people to assist them to unlock their hidden and powerful potential. Today, Janine will share with us her thoughts about working with the indigenous community. Welcome Janine Bailey, over to you. Again, thank you very much for this invitation to join this amazing ICF chapter in this webinar. And I'm delighted to be also working with my fellow colleagues, Yogish and Jedi. So um, very, very, very humble and very privileged. And it really is a privilege to speak about my experiences as a professional coach and to have the opportunity to reflect upon democratizing coaching and busting some of those myths that Jay Shree talked about. Um, when I first read the title, I thought this is a very, very exciting and appropriate topic. It's, it's very topical, I feel as well at, at this time. And I asked myself, what does it really mean to democratize coaching at, at the heart of it? And the initial things I came up with were things like belonging, giving back, giving back to coaching communities, 
and giving back to related non-coaching communities, supporting grassroots, and so much more. And then I asked myself, what have I done to support democratization? And I started to reflect upon everything I've been involved in in the past year or so to support democratization. And it was really, uh, it's something that I hadn't really taken the time out to do before. And so again, it was a, a lovely experience. And um, so again, I really appreciate this opportunity to speak about some of those things that I believe I've done to support that. And so what I came up with was largely my volunteering, uh, especially in COVID times. I accepted the role of pillar head for coaching excellence for ICF Australasia. And that was a much bigger role than I expected. And, and uh, but again, it's through that ability to be able to support our coaches, our coaching networks with the end user in mind. So a lot of, a lot of uh, energy has gone into that. So I've also done supervision for coaches based in India, which was done over several months. So that was a, that was a beautiful piece of work that I was invited to, to be involved in. Running workshops for mental health organizations. So being able to offer it to people that, again, perhaps ordinarily might not have been introduced to coaching. Participating in the Climate Coaching Alliance to support climate change through coaching conversations in organizations in communities and families. So something I'm very passionate about, especially living in Australia, uh, especially given the, the, the bushfires that we had uh, over a year ago now. So, so climate coaching is very important. Also volunteering for Damien Goldberg's supervision course. So Damien is another thought leader who's going to be coming up in a later webinar. Providing mentoring and coaching and supervision for training participants, I train as the provider of Empower World's coaching training program to RISE 2025, which is a New Zealand initiative, which has a powerful and ambitious vision of empowering 100,000 indigenous, indigenous women by 2025. So Rachel Patero is a Maori Wahini leader, and she is the founder of RISE 2025. And I supply her, I partner with her, to provide ICF approved coach training by my company Empower World. And Rachel and I, we co-lead co -lead this training together. And so as part of giving back to RISE 2025, I've mentored Rachel over the past year or so for her PCC credential and also to, su to support her to step into mastery even more because she has got a powerful vision and she is really changing the world. And when, what struck me when I reviewed the work that I trust has supported democratization of coaching is the ripple effect and the impact of the work that I've done with Rachel to support Maori and Pacifica women and more recently men through RISE 2025. So a little bit of background information here as part of my work as a credential coach I train people to become professional coaches by offering an ICF approved coach training program with my wonderful business partner, Marie Quigley. And we started this in Qatar in the Middle East where I lived for many years. And Marie and I trained Rachel, who is this amazing Maori woman and also a friend. And when she moved back to New Zealand, she had this powerful vision to support and empower indigenous women, 100,000 by 2025. Rachel is also the first Maori ICF credential coach in the world. So another wonderful thing to be a part of. And fortunately for me, Rachel asked me to partner with her to deliver this training, this coach training, something we talked about and dreamed about doing on our walks on the Corniche in Qatar and the Middle East. And this work that she had decided to create, this vision for RISE 2025, it really struck a chord for me because I have two Australian Aboriginal aunts who married my father's two brothers, um, quite, weird, quite weirdly, but uh, thank goodness he, they did. And I love my two Aboriginal aunts dearly. And what I've observed is that they have su suppressed their Aboriginal heritage. And actually that, that really breaks my heart. I can, <laughs> I can feel the emotions coming up right now. And it might not break their hearts, I don't know whether it does or not that they 
suppress their heritage as they really aren't interested in talking about about their heritage. I've, I've tried to broach them, but they quickly push it down. So this is my way of somehow giving back to the Indigenous people whose land was taken from them. So my intention is to share more about RISE 2025 with the aim of empowering 100,000 Indigenous women to support this debunking of the myth about coaching is only for the privileged. The first seed was planted in 2015, which Rachel planted, and it's grown tremendously in New Zealand. And it's still the beginning of its journey to become a 50 meter native New Zealand Kauri tree. And that tree, its seeds are growing and blowing across the world. That first seed was to start training women to become indigenous women to become professional credential coaches. And Rachel, through her ability to create relationships by asking powerful questions, listening deeply, listening deeply, formed an initial collaboration with the Maori Women's Development Inc. or the MWDI. And the MWDI support Indigenous women who start up their own businesses with finance lending as well as, as, well as business mentoring and coaching support. And through Rachel's magical way of partnering to create ecological win-win outcomes, MWDI, MWDI became, well, they came to realize that actually mentoring alone was not always effective to support the women, particularly when the businesses were in huge debt and failing dismally. They came to the realization through Rachel's support that they had to support the women with mindset changes which would then lead to changes in behaviors, habits and outcomes. So Rachel and I, we trained 16 in-house coaches in 2015. And although some of those coaches have left MWDI, there are still many there who continue to support female entrepreneurs through this organization. And all of these women who took part in this training still continue to coach. They've, they've, it's part of their being. They've integrated their own Indigenous models and brought them into the way that they coach. And that's what mm -hmm. RISE 2025, the, the coach training program also has done. It's brought in the New Zealand, uh, Maori and Pacifica models of working with people, people. So they've brought that into the training. And so the, the way of coaching, the way of being is, is out into the whānau, the family out into the tribes, out into the community, and so much more. So it's been a real privilege to do this work. And so again, these women are taking these coaching conversations to people that ordinarily wouldn't have access to a coach. And today I heard the CEO of MWDI share on an ICF Australasia webinar panel, which is celebrating International Coaching Week. And she shared that the coaching that they provide in her organization is life-changing and transformational. If any of the women are in trouble financially, the first thing they do is assign them with a coach to support their mindset and behavioral changes so that they can then come back to MWDI and secure loans to expand their, their business, their work. So since this first seed was planted in 2015, Rachel and I have trained another further eight cohorts and in 2019, we ran our first cohort for men. The men could see the powerful changes that were happening for the women, for the women and their, the, the family, the Fano and the tribes. And they wanted what their women were experiencing. So they noticed the changes. They noticed the change in conversations and the ways of being and having a positive impact, again, on the Fano, on the communities, on their tribes. And and through businesses as well. And so this has led to an incredible changes within the communities. And as a consequence of the men joining our programs, I am now very fortunate to be coaching a Maori chief. I wouldn't have known he was a Maori chief when I met him on the training. And through my, I guess my privilege to, to be coaching him one-to-one, -one, I've, I've come to learn his story. And as a consequence of the training that he did with RISE 2025, 
He's also recently taken on a new role, which includes a large component of that includes coaching and coaching to support Indigenous people to come off the streets, come out of their cars and get into sustainable housing. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing that ripple effect of how coaching can, can really go out to those people that are in, in real dire need of that support. So the commencement of RISE to 2025 back in 2015, it also started many other conversations and many other initiatives, including public coaching programs, again, attracting many Indigenous women, public leadership program, using coaching skills, supporting Indigenous entrepreneurs with specific coaching and mentoring skills and programs, in-house coaching and leadership programs, mainly in government ministries, wanting to support diversity, inclusion, and provide Indigenous support to, to their people, and so much more. I'm hearing this wonderful work that Rachel has been able to instigate. And so she's been supporting leaders in many areas of life, breaking down racial and, and unconscious bias barriers, building partnerships and relationships and improving outcomes. And these initiatives have been undertaken or funded in a variety of different ways to make it accessible to many people, not just the few, not just the privileged, through Rachel's ability to create collaborative partnerships. And this means she can offer reasonably priced and complementary programs to the end user she wants to support, men and women, particularly Indigenous. And so Rachel has secured funding from tertiary institutions, the government, private sector, multinational organisations, including Shopify. So Shopify were very willing and wanting to partner with Rachel to support financing of Indigenous women initiatives. There's also tribal funding, scholarships, uh, people's personal investment, which has been made at reasonable rates because Rachel is an excellent negotiator of creating win-win conversations and partnerships. So for example, the, the, the accommodation that we used when we could do face-to-face -face coach training was offered in swap for someone to join our program. And one of Rachel's favorite pieces of work has been the work she's done in Chile, working with the Machu Picchu women entrepreneurs who work in the eco space with the provision of providing coach, sorry, group coaching. And this trip was um, again funded by a university that wanted to again support indigenous leaders in Chile. Uh, there's so much more I could share, but I'm conscious of, I'm probably getting close to the end of my time. So from this beautiful seed, Rachel has first decided to plant on the last day of her coach training with Empower World. So much has unfolded, which has allowed me to support her in many ways to lead to the democratization of coaching. And in fact, uh, being part of the panel conversation today, uh, an ICF Australasia where the CEO of MWDI was um, part of that panel. Um, we were able to also talk about coaching supervision. So I'm, I'm hoping that that will happen very soon. So these seeds can seem wonderful when they are planted and, and we have the opportunity, we all have the opportunity to, to decide the seeds to be planted. And if we want to nurture them, if we want to water and feed those seeds to allow amazing growth to happen, to allow trees to start evolving. So thank you so much for allowing me to share this story. My hope is that seeds will continue to scatter across the globe to again ensure that coaching is for the many, if not for everyone, that's my dream, and not for the few. So. I do have a link to Rachel's, um, a video that Rachel um, provided on her website. I'll put that in the, web, in, the, um, in the chat box, unless I have time, but I may not. I'm not sure where I am with time. You have, you have about three minutes, Janine, if you three want minutes. to play that. Okay, I will. Um, have I got the ability to share? Yes, I think I... 
vision for RISE 2025 has always been about 100,000 Indigenous women working across community, corporations, and across nations. And today, we're doing that. The RISE experience for me, it was, um, it was exciting, it was challenging, it was also a really safe place uh, to learn and grow and push myself outside the comfort zone to create an even better life. And it was really special to do this with other Indigenous women who became sisters. One of the really important things that I learned was about my beliefs, the beliefs that I hold about myself, you know, about others, and about the world in general. I feel like Indigenous women and, and the, well, what Indigenous women do is that you, you are natural navigators. Non-Indigenous culture, knowing how to navigate between the two spaces is a gift. The future for me with RISE 2025 is I'd love to be able to take the programme and coaching into Kura. In 2025, for me, I want to have made a difference in corporate culture, so bringing some of the um, Indigenous and Māori values into ways that we do things, because I can see that there's a correlation between what is needed in the future of work and what we can bring to that space. Such a rich and powerful part of my journey, and um, yeah, it's such a it's such a privilege and such an honor to be here. So, thank you. Thank you, Janine. That was indeed a very rich and powerful story, and thank you so much for the deep impact work that you do. And uh, like Johnny said in the chat, more power to you. Our next speaker from Singapore believes in making deep deeper connections through the transformative power of conversations. Jedi Alex Ko is a master certified coach and founder of Coaching Changes Lives, Asia's leading coach training, mentoring, and supervision institute. Jedi is a sought after transformative coach and keynote speaker on the future of leadership and coaching. He has been featured on Forbes Coaches Council, where he shares his expert views on team coaching with industry leaders and organizations. He's also the creator of Metaphorium and Transformative Systemic Co-Creative Coaching, a transformative conversational process that creates deep inner work for leaders and teams. Jedi was awarded the top 100 Global Leaders in Education Award by GFEL. He's also the recipient of the top 101 Global Coaching Leaders Award by World HRD Congress. He's the author of the much anticipated upcoming book, OMG, Coaching is Conversational Mastery. Jedi, can't wait to read it. Today, he's going to share with us how coaching is an essential skill for all generations and multi-spectrum application across work, family, and relationships. Jedi Alex Ko, may the force be with you. The force is strong. Thanks, Nisha. Let's give a round of applause to Nisha and uh, amazing sharing by Janine. I really love what she shares about the ripple effect. And once again, thank, um, thank you, ICF chapter Pune, um, for this amazing blessing and this honor to be here, spending the next um, 15 minutes with you guys sharing something really powerful today. Right. Uh, it, can we give a round of applause to all the ICF um, behind the scenes team? Uh, the ICF Pune chapter, amazing, amazing uh, people. They put this together, and this it, this couldn't be made possible by this amazing team who put in the hard work all the days. You know, you have seen their postings on Instagram, on Facebook. Do share them with your friends as well. And it's an honor uh, to be part of the uh, panel together with Janine and Yogesh um, to share with you guys a little bit about our insight into the uh, about democratization of coaching in this new economy. 
right? So I'm going to share you something really exciting and hope this can really inspire you and just to take your coaching conversation and a whole nother level. Okay, so now this is what we're going to do. I'm going to share you something really exciting. This is what my focus is on today. In the next 15 minutes, I'm going to share you something really interesting. Coaching as an essential skill for generations and multi-spectrum application across work, family, and relationship. Now, a while ago, um, I was invited by different people to different parts of the world to speak about coaching. And I remember one thing that, you know, oftentimes we think that coaching is only just for leaders, for senior executives, or for individuals who um, you know, are up there in organizational level. But today, coaching is becoming widespread, being utilized by parents, being utilized by youths, utilized by families, teachers, and all across the workspace, more and more people are realizing the requisite power of coaching. I remember one time there was a story uh, many years ago when I was invited to meet um, this group of people from the Philippines. And it was this little village that's unheard of. And when I went to that village, every place about the village was kind of torn down. And there were stones all around, there were rocks all around, and they were trying to build their home. They have a lack of infrastructure. There wasn't internet access. So we, we, we were tasked to do one thing, to bring hope into those places. And that was when we began this project called Project Hope. And I remember seeing this one boy here. This was about 13 years ago when I met this little boy. And when I saw this boy, I said, hey, you know, and he, he had so much joy and so much laughter. And when I look at his eyes, you could tell that, you know, it's, it's, it's one that's so sweet, so innocent. And when I had a conversation with him, it was just a beautiful flow of conversation. And even though his command of English wasn't as strong, but we communicated, we knew how we felt. I was using a lot of metaphors with him, using a lot of imageries. We're building sandcastles. We're building shapes and objects. We're communicating in a way that what most people think it's communication, which is using words. We're using a lot of nonverbal communications. We're using a lot of metaphors. We're using a lot of imageries. And in that process, something magical happens. The beauty of coaching isn't in what's spoken. The beauty of coaching, it's what is present. The beauty of coaching, it's that magic of conversation taking at that very moment. And I always remember when I left that place after building the houses, it was, you know, we spent days and nights trying to um, clear the space and to build houses for the, for the individuals there and for, uh, for the people over there. And when I left there, the families of the boy said to me, say, Jedi, you know, you got to leave your fingerprints here. So they, 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 they created a little space, a little cement area and say, Jedi, put your hand here. Because when you come back to this village, I want you to remember there's always a place for you in our hearts. A little word of engagement, even though we spoke very little, even though we couldn't understand, and even though there was a language barrier, but it's something that transcends even the language, which is the language of love. Coaching, it's about taking that process with the client and loving the client for who they are. And about helping the client to find a sense of acceptance to who they are on the inside of them. And that's the beauty of coaching. One thing I want to inspire all of us is this, as coaches, the beauty of coaching is that we love people. Coaching is a people's business. Coaching, it's all about loving people, paying it forward. And I love what Janine said earlier is about the ripple effect that we're making positively around the world. Yes, there, there is a part of coaching a practice, a coaching business, where we're building an income stream for ourselves and our families, but it's also another part about coaching. It's the impact that we're making around the world. Just a few months ago, we made an impact in the peoples of Philippines where they, they were struggling. A lot of them were, uh, were facing a lot of crisis with the pandemics going on. We were able to help through our partner organizations there to really help inspire and teach and equip coaches with the coaching skills. In fact, one of our partners sponsored a whole bunch of coaches with coaching skills. We, we, we credit them in the ICF competencies, in the ICF trainings, and help them empower them so that they can empower more communities that they're touching. And this is what I often say, that coaching is an essential skill for all generations and multi-spectrum for all applications across work, family, relationships, learning to leverage the requisite power in times of chaos and uncertainty to move mountains 
and defy gravity. Defying gravity, it's like taking the weight off our shoulders and saying, hey, you know, we know that the world around us, it's, it's in, in complete chaos. There are a lot of things that's running around us and it's that the pressure is surmounting. But how do we face each day? How do we face the storms in life, John's? How do we face all this? Well, the big thing is this. We can utilize the power of coaching. So today we ask this question. Is coaching an essential skill? Is it a hard skill? Is it a soft skill? Or is it a non-essential skill? Today in the workforce, many people are thinking, okay, you know, coaching, it's about communication and communication, it's about soft skills, soft skills training, but that cannot be further from the truth. The reality is this, there isn't anything soft about coaching. There isn't anything hard, but coaching is an essential life force for the organization. Think about this. Every single organization needs to be able to communi communicate with clarity to the people within, internal stakeholders and external stakeholders. And to be able to communicate well, they need the ability of coaching. For leaders to lead effective teams today in a distributed workforce with virtual teams, remote teams and gig workers all around the world, we are living in a time of asynchronous workforce which means that we have, we're planting a time period where we need to engage our people even much more. Leaders have to engage with them much more. In fact, there was a recent poll that ICF posted that showed that increasingly employees want more external coaching for the people. So coaching today is an essential skill. Just yesterday, I was speaking to a, a group of coaches, a community of coaches as well, and, and I taught them one thing, that the critical leadership approach for the future economy it's coaching. And coaching, it's about having that sense of conversational mastery. Coaching, it's conversational mastery. Why is coaching so important for us today? It's because the sense of us being able to have mastery in a communication and conversational approach, to understand words beyond words, to understand that, hey, I don't have to, un I don't have to be able to articulate my words well. I don't have to be able to speak in fluent language. I don't have to be able to speak in sophistry, in, in, in the latitude of different phrases, but I can speak simply with the sense of brevity, but having that connection with the individual, allowing the connection that goes deeper, speaking what, what we call the language of the heart of the human connection. So when we think about this, one of the things that I enjoy so much is about looking at coaching from a multi-spectrum approach. And I call this the multi-spectrum process. Coaching as an art and the science of conversation. And when we think of conversations, often we think about conversations in a very linear function. And we think about it as a way of communicating our ideas and our thoughts, but we don't realize that it's multi-spectrum. Sometimes I call this a full spectrum approach to communication. Why is that so? Because coaching transcends the boundaries of language. So I'm going to share with you five elements. And these five elements are, are, are an extract from one of our programs that we run around the world to help equip leaders, coaches, youth workers around the world. And these five elements of con conversational flow are this. Element number one, it's the element of transaction. The element of transaction. When we have a conversation with someone, we're transacting something. There's an exchange that's happening. Sometimes I call them that exchange, the conversation exchange is happening. I'm sending a message to you and you're sending a message to me. That individual or the client is trying to tell us something. The community is trying to tell us something. The parent, the youth, the child is trying to tell us something. The transaction is happening. The transaction of a need, the transaction of a want, the transaction of hope, the transaction of possibilities. That's, that's a, the sense of transaction that's happening. The second element is the element of translation. So when we converse with someone, we're translating that information into our own perspective and we're making reference in line with our own worldview. So we're translating the information that we're receiving into our own world. Are we aware of it? And the beauty of coaching conversations is that when we become aware of how we are translating another person's word, we begin to appreciate that the diversities of ideas, diversities of language, diversities of culture. The human race is a race of diversity. 
but there's beauty in diversity. And this is the beauty of, of the human race, where we can enjoy and appreciate different facets of life, different traditions, different approaches, different life philosophies, the element of translation. Next is the element of transportation. And that is the element of what we call like a filter. When you have a little membrane or little filter, there's a little thing that allows things to pass through and doesn't allow the rest to pass through. All of us have this transportation within our minds. When we receive an information, when we receive communication, there's something in our minds that blocks or passes through and allowing us to create a connection. Sometimes when we look at an individual, we say, hey, I don't know why, but I just, I just love speaking to you. There's something about you, even though I've just met you for the first time, but there's something about you that I feel connected about. And that's the element of transudation. Number four, the element of transduction. And that's the element of the process, the element of process getting from one place to the next place, getting from one place to the next place, the process flow. And so oftentimes in a communication process, one thing happens. For anything to move forward, for us to get from a present state to a desired state, there must be this sense of movement. Conversation is about moving. It's about moving someone to some place. It's about moving the heart, the spirit into action. And finally, the element of transformation. Every conversation has the potentiality for transformation. And I love what Janine says that the seed, it's really like the seed. Yesterday, I was telling um, the coaches from around the world that the seed, as small as a mustard seed, but inside it rests the greatness within. Greatness is not what we do, but greatness is who we are. It's about a sense of being. Because out of that seed, it, within that seed lies the potentiality for greatness. And that transformation will surely happen. Too often, we want to force transformation, but we don't realize that transformation will happen. We just got to rest and realize that transformation is happening in that moment. So the beauty is this, when we as coaches and when we are helping equip the world, whether it's youths, workers, families with the ability to communicate better, with the ability to utilize coaching conversations, we're able to create transformation in the workspace, transformation at home and transformation at play. Now I'm going to share with you two very simple keys as I, as, as I wrap things up for all of us here. And these two keys I found them to be really, really powerful. Key number one, the expensive principle. Not expensive in terms of dollars and cents, but expensive in terms of the largest, of the plentitude, of the plethora of things. Because coaching as a full spectrum approach covers multi-spectrum of communication. At the workspace, it's about a professional engagement amongst internal and external stakeholders. We have to change and approach our conversational style. At home, it's the interplay between different family roles and the vertical range of conversations. Now, if you are a parent, the way you converse with your spouse is a different language. If you're conversing with your children, it's a different language. If you're conversing with a parent, it's a different language. So there's a vertical range and there's an interplay that's happening. I've seen families, you know, having done a lot of family coaching as well and a lot of youth coaching, I've seen families who, uh, whose parents, parents growing up, spending 20, 30 years of their life focusing in their relationship with their children, the downward relationship, but neglecting the relationship or the side with the spouses. So only to realize when the child has grown up and leave, the, uh, and leave their home and to be, to, to be together with their own partners, they realize something has changed. That they found some emptiness within themselves because they spent 20 years building a relationship downwards, but they forget about the horizontal relationship with the spouse that they have neglected for the last 20 years. And at play, the interharmonics of groups and social impact. Engaging with our friends, engaging with our social group, engaging with the community at large, empowering lives, going beyond and above ourselves, at work, at home, at play. And this is the expansive approach of coaching and how it can impact many different lives. In fact, today, I have a whole YouTube channel to teach coaches around the world for free, right? Teaching them and powering the skill sets from ACC all the way to MCC. In fact, there was a coach who wrote into me, say, Jedi, I really appreciate your videos because, you know, I couldn't afford coaching. But when I watched your videos, I was able to learn how to utilize the coaching approach and watch your demonstrations to really impact lives. In fact, there was one student that came to me saying, Jedi, after watching your videos, I applied for my application with ICF and I passed my PCC. When I hear these stories, I'm encouraged because the videos are created to help and change lives. And I hope these videos will go out there to spread the message of hope, the message of love, 
and a message of the conversation of mastery. So there's three different areas here, the expansive principles of the verticals, that is the separation of professional states to create safety, the expansive principles of the horizontals, that is the laminal conversation of flow, and the expansive principle of the oblique asymptote, the depth of the heart and of who. What is the asymptote? It's a little line that we draw on a graph. It gets closer and closer to the infinity point, but never quite touching that line. In the same way, when we have conversations with our clients and our communities, when we go deeper in the depth of conversations, we're touching the very heart of the individual. And to that degree, we touch the heart of the lives. To that degree, we begin to see transformation. And that's the beauty of this expansive principle. And the last principle I want to share with all of us is this principle of commonality. The sense of coaching conversation is about building commonality with our clients, with our communities, with our families, with our loved ones. And commonality is key in building trust and relationships and building that safe space. And sometimes I call this the quantity factor, going beyond the formalities of words and our words as our very born. And sometimes, you know, people say, how can I trust you? How can I trust your word? But if we had the quantity factor, your words become the born. And there are three different things that commonality is built upon, competence, character, and care. How professional we are, how competent we are in our skill, our very character that we, that we possess, and how we care for our others. As coaches, I often tell coaches, it's the test, the limits test of coaches is in, in our ability to care for others. Like how Yogesh and how Janine has done around the world, making impact, the sense of care, helping, giving, the sense of impacting lives. And this is what I often see. The deeper the level of trust, the deeper the depth of conversations. So today, I'm going to leave us with this one thought, that the magic of conversation is in coaching. Because coaching is an experience to be experienced. Coaching is an experience to be experienced. Thank you all so much for the amazing 15 minutes that we have together. That was wonderful, Jedi. And uh, I have a lot of things in that the chat box is buzzing. Uh, so we will come back to you with a couple of thoughts and questions that we have for you. But uh, for now, over to Nisha to introduce the next speaker. Thanks, Aparna. And thank you, Jedi, for bringing hope and leaving your fingerprints on all the lives that you impact. You may all, and may you always defy gravity. Uh, our final speaker for this morning is our very own Punekar, Yogesh Padgaonkar. Yogesh is a master certified coach and founder of Harmony Consultants. As an executive coach, Yogesh has developed his unique team coaching method, which has helped leadership teams to boldly envision a brighter future and systemically work towards the same. He's carried out executive coaching as well as systemic team coaching for leaders and leadership teams across various reputed organizations. Prior to his engagement as a full-time coach and consultant, Yogesh has around two decades of industry experience as a CHRO, a business head, a certified assessor of EQ, and SHL certified assessor for Development Center. Apart from his professional pursuits, Yogesh is a poet and has published a book on his poetry collection. If you're connected with him on LinkedIn, you probably know this already. He's an avid traveler and has successfully completed driving expeditions across the length of India from Ladakh to Kanyakumari. Today, he will be speaking to us uh, about making coaching easier, holding coaching space, and how to make coaching competencies to everyday life. Welcome, Yogesh. You're all yours. Yogesh, you're on mute. Hi. Thank you. Uh, listening to Janine and Jedi, I was uh, almost out of words. And uh, the people who know me know that uh, this generally does not happen with me. So thank you both of you for uh, that beautiful uh, presentation. So what I'm going to do is uh, just to keep myself on track of the deadline, I'm just going to share with you thoughts on democratizing the coaching. And uh, as Aparna said in the beginning that we are going to co-create something. So I just thought, let's start co-creating right now. So on your screen, you would see a scan code or there's a menti. If, if that code does not work, there's www.menti.com and enter the code. I'm just going to ask you a few questions. Uh, to me, democracy is a very thriving thing. Democracy is here and now. 
and uh, it's just it's just comfortable to know who am i speaking to and what is the audience about uh, so if you're ready if you scan your codes uh, let me uh, let me straight away get it to i know a lot of you are put into the chat but we just like to move the audience a little better on this course on democratization so let me just get you the first question that uh, very simple question just type in which city are you from just let's see what we, how many cities are present that we have ah pune comes of course kolkata singapore So we have we have literally different corners of India, Singapore. Obviously, we have Australia. All those which we are typing, uh, your cities in. It's great to have you here. Oh, Nagpur, Nasik. Wow. So, Aparna, for your co-creation, I'm just creating a collage of uh, you know where all we have people from. I'm just spending some time on that before I get into my this club. Lovely to be here. Hyderabad, wow, super. And I know that today the crowd is mixed between uh, mixed between uh, coaches, the people who are practicing coaches, coaching, and the people who are leaders. And let me just define a very simple definition of leader. Anybody is who is leading life, in my definition, is a leader. Uh, so you are either a coach who is training to be a coach or a credentialed coach, or you are a person who is, uh, you know, a leader, leader in life. I just wanted to get a sense before we start. Uh, you know, you just have option one and two. I just wanted to get a sense of the audience before we start, and I hope this will help Aparna for uh, co-creating what uh, she has in mind when we go next. Love you. Interesting. Uh, brilliant to see equal number of coaches and leaders in this audience, and that's 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 encouraging. Right. Fine. I know I have a time limit, so I just wanted to get a sense of the audience mix. And uh, as you keep voting, what I'll do is. We'll go ahead with our topic of discussion today, and let me begin. As, as I was saying, the democracy is something here and now. What I'm going to do in the next 10 minutes is that, 12 minutes is that. One is I'll talk about what democratization of coaching means as far as I'm concerned. Second thing is that respecting all of you to be present here, I'm going to leave you with two or three things to reflect on, which you could do as we end the session. You don't need any training for that. Okay, to my mind, these behaviors uh, help democratization of coaching, whether you are a coach or a, or, or a leader. So let me first dive for first five minutes into what democratization means to me and the themes of democratization. Okay. So here I go. You know, Janine, it's amazing that you talked about the heritage and people are not reflecting on the heritage. And I, as I was talking about this whole concept of democratization, the city where I live in, about an hour's distance, driving distance from where I am right now, there lived a, a, a noble person in 13th century who was the first example of democratizing knowledge. And when knowledge was in the realm of few people because the knowledge was written in a language which was understood by the few elite, here came a person who was not even a 20-year-old person called Nyaneshwar. And the government of India issued a coin in his uh, honor in 1999. And he actually took the knowledge, converted the knowledge which was in the language which was understood only by the few elite to a language of commoners. He connected that knowledge to the daily life of commoners and he literally unleashed the floodgates of knowledge for a common person. And Jedi, as you said that, you know, you don't have to be really qualified in this or that way. Knowledge should be available, unlocking value for everyone without biases, without the biases of your education, age, background, 
gender, and that's really, to my mind, what democratization means. The second theme of democratization to me, I know I'm just calling from Janeshwar to Charlie Chaplin, but you know, this man was the one of the best philosophers, as I see, and the people who talk less, they say that when they talk, uh, they talk with profound wisdom. Uh, so the second theme brings me to Charlie Chaplin's uh, 1940 movie called Great Dictator. And those of you who have seen the movie, the last speech in The Great Dictator, it just gives you goosebumps. It's just a speech which talks about what democracy is and what is the right of every human being. So what I'm going to do is that I'm just going to play a video which is about 50 seconds. Listen carefully because to my mind, much before the ICF competencies uh, came into existence, uh, the gentleman who made us laugh so many times also defined what is democratizing the coaching. Wherever you are, clouds are lifting, sun is breaking through. We are coming out of the darkness of the night. We are coming into a new world kindly world, where men will rise above their hate, their greed, and brutality. Look up, Henry. The soul of man has been given wings, and at last he is beginning to fly. He is flying into the rainbow, into the light of hope, into the future, the glorious future that belongs to you, to me, and to all of us. Look up, Henry. Look up. Every soul needs to be given wings to fly into the future it deserves. To my mind, that's the essence of coaching. And uh, what I loved about both these examples is that coaching has to be unshackled from jargons. Coaching has to be unshackled from a language which could be understood only by the few. And coaching has to be taken to the people, everybody, anybody who can understand it. I just love the way Jedi said it, you know, teachers, parents, everybody, can implement the coaching skills. Now, all, all this to my mind is a democratization of coaching. To me, uh, the ripple effect that you need to create in the society uh, is dependent on two pillars in my area of work. Uh, so the work that I do, and my Pune friends do this, is uh, I help coaches who are on their credential journey, and I do the mentor coaching completely pro bono. Okay, so this is my commitment to the coach community. You don't even have to know me, but anybody who thinks that I can add value, I'm a registered mentor coach. I help people uh, pro bono without any cost. Because to my mind, the more the number of coaches, the coaching ripple effect will happen. And the whole theme of my work is about making coaching simplified. Sometimes I'm seeing the people getting awed by the competencies, by the training. How can we simplify the coaching? That's really the work I do. The second pillar for the ripple effect of coaching to democratize, to my mind, is the leaders and the leaders in the corporate world, the leaders in the social world. Uh, because every time, I mean, last for about 10 years, I've been doing this program that how do you how do you really use the coach competencies as a leader? Because to my mind, when you're leading a set of 10 people, and uh, if you consider an average family size of three, at any point of time, you're impacting 30 lives. I don't know how many leaders really look at their uh, role in that capacity. So the leader has a humongous ability to impact uh, and create a ripple effect if they use the coach competency. You don't have to be credentialed coach to really, uh, really use the coach competencies. So what I'm going to do is that based on my experience and with respect to your time today, what I thought is that let me share with you just three themes. Uh, these are the three principles uh, the good news is that they do not require any training, but if you just reflect on what I'm saying, you can start using the coach competencies or simplify your coaching tomorrow onwards. And that's really the whole purpose of taking your time. And I just love the theme which was said in the flyer, being a coach rather than doing coaching. How do you, how do you really do that? Right? The first principle for me is egg learning theory. 
Okay, I don't know whether there is any such theory or not, but let me quickly uh, say what it is. Uh, they say that when the egg is broken from outside, life ends. But when you allow the egg to break from inside, life begins. And that's really the first principle. In the coaching, in the technical language, we call it contracting. And many a times the coaches do the, you know, uh, because of their experience, because of their knowledge, they have this temptation to influence the contract. The contracting piece really has to be what the person wants to go, where the person wants to go. And if you allow people to really do that, you'll be amazed at where they take you. Because whether you are, when you're using the coaching competencies, let the client lead you. That's the first principle. And let the contracting happen with the client. And for the leaders who want to use the coach competencies, I'll give you another simple example from my workshop that I do on leaders as a coach. I do a, a part of that workshop talks about how do you really hold a development dialogue for any individual. And you know, typically when I do for a technology industry, leaders tell me, no, 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 Yogesh, all this theory is fine, uh, you know, but you know, we work on a technology and our youngsters want to work on a complete different technology. What development dialogue are we going to have? So one fine day, I just decided to be a little bold and I said, okay, I don't know what you guys do. I'm not a technical person, but let's do one thing. You play the role of your team member and I'll play your role. And let me try doing a development dialogue with you. Now I was taking a complete risk. I don't know the company. I don't know the, what the work they do, but I said, okay. And they decided to give me a tough time. It's always good to give a tough time to a trainer or a coach, right? In front of the whole crowd. The beauty is that if you just stick to this whole principle of let them guide you, actually we evolve the development plans live. Okay. So let, whether you're a parent, whether you're a coach, whether you're a leader, when somebody comes to you for an aspiration, don't try to influence that aspiration. Give some air to that aspiration. Try to create more awareness about what that aspiration is, how that is important, why that is important, what is the output a person is seeking to. What you think that person should do is absolutely irrelevant. That's, that's the first principle. Second principle is the principle of vulnerability. Because I just love what Jedi says that coaching happens not through language, but happens through presence. And there's a principle of reciprocity, which works. Now my Pune friend knows this little childish game that I play, but I'm, I, I, I can't see all of you, but I'm just inviting all of you to play this with me. Okay. For a couple of minutes, just hold your hands like this. All of you just hold your hands like this. If you can see me, just hold your hands like this. Just humor me. Yeah. And just put them on your nose. Look around you. Many of you would have put it around on the cheek when I said put it on, on your nose. You know, I can I can I can go on talking about this forever. But feel people follow what they see and what you do, not what you say. And that's what I just completely agree with Jedi. It's not about coaching, it's not about words, it's about your presence. Quick one, my last three, four minutes. What is vulnerability? It's a big word. Simply meaning, when you are a coach, we have something called a chemistry meeting. How do you use the chemistry meeting? It's extremely important. Are you going to tell a person how smart you are? Because then the principle of reciprocity works and the person will also tell you how, how smart that person is. And then you would wonder what are you going to do coaching? About? Coaching happens from a space of vulnerability. So what I typically do, and it has helped me tremendously in my coaching, my chemistry meeting, I actually narrate uh, my, all my faux pas, my mistakes, my failures. And by the way, there are many. Okay, I have to really select a top few. And when I do that, there's a magic happen because what happens is that a person is no longer under the stress. I mean, Jedi talked about the safety, right? The person is no longer about the stress. He's no longer apologetic about who she or he is. And Janine talk about this, you know, people suppressing their heritage or their background. I mean, just you make them comfortable about who they are and that's when the coaching journey starts. A lot of coaches don't realize is that your coaching journey does not start from the goal setting session. The coaching journey starts from your chemistry session. And the way you introduce yourself, your, uh, your client is going to behave that. If you're a leader, just go and tell people, I don't know this, can you teach me? Your juniors will have a joy teaching something to the boss. I have seen leaders doing this very funnily. 
they don't know something they want to figure it out but they would go and say okay let me see how you do it as if you know i am now evaluating you no why do why do you make life complicated why can't you just be vulnerable to see who you are because the moment you are vulnerable you connect presence is a big word but if you just decide to be who you are it just opens the flag gate because coaching would only happen when people open up coaching does not happen when there are smart intellectual conversations right the transformation that jerai talked about happens when the flag gates of emotion is open up. my mentor coaches and thank thank god for them uh, cindy from south africa and ram ramathan from uh, india they literally banged it into me because i had this problem about asking powerful questions in my coaching so every time a lot of people make that mistake questions are not out there questions happen to you as you are listening to the people and a simple way of looking at it is that focus on the person not on the content okay and how do you do that because all of us especially with the corporate career we are like doctors anybody comes with a problem we are ready to give prescriptions quick and when we learn coaching we become smarter and try to convey our uh, prescriptions as questions but those were not questions right so finally a simple technique just observe the feelings of the person and go on exploring the feelings if you go on exploring the quiet feelings the questions will come to you whether you are a coach or not hey i sense that you are sad i sense that there is a joy what is it about what is it about the the science behind that is that the coaching fails when you try to interpret what the other person is intending okay but when you explore the feelings the person gives you the data and the data coming from the person is the most authentic data that you get for the things how so intelligent you are you know, if you just follow these three principles the egg learning theory let the agenda be of that person whom you are coaching vulnerability just be who you are you don't have to be the smartest person even i could become a coach please understand that the only reason uh, uh, one chapter asked me to talk about is that you know it's a very great motivator you guys said if you can become a coach anybody can become a coach. so all the rest the third is feelings are the significant data points because if you just do that coaching is a joy it's an organic stuff and you enjoy coaching having said that i think i overshot my time by 3 4 minutes by trying to dive into the technology before my apologies are pardon Uh, I know I will get a punishment from Pony Chapter later, but I will bear that. Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication, and just as I said, democratizing coaching. If you are if you are on your coach journey, if you need mentor coaching, any help, mentor coaching is a big one. Just reach out to me. We'll be very happy to help you. Don't even have to know me, and this is not a commercial proposal, and that's why I'm just saying it out there. So, thank you so much. Thank you so very much for that riveting insights, uh, Yogesh. I'm sure our audience has found it really useful and will apply uh, in their daily lives. But I'm personally moved by the ripple effect that all three of uh, three speakers have spoken about. Uh, I'm personally very connected to the vulnerability aspect, and I, I've been uh, a follower of Brené Brown for a long time. So, what I would want to understand, maybe from this, is an open question to all of you, is. Uh, the moment you acknowledge that vulnerability is when you can really do something about it right so how can we ensure that uh, the larger audience of uh, of coaching or people who are undergoing those feelings emotions acknowledge this vulnerability because only if you know and you know that you're aware of it can you do something about it right so how do we approach that so i i'd like to open this up for any of you guy janine Yogesh, if you would uh, want to answer that, no, oh, go ahead, Yogesh. No, Janine, absolutely. Please go. I, 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 and I'm sure we've all got. Um, we'd all like to share on this one because it's so important to be able to support our clients to be able to be vulnerable because that's when the most powerful, powerful transformation occurs when, when we can step into that place as as a coach. Uh, to also allow our client to step into their vulnerability, so it, and a lot of it comes down to the contracting from the very beginning to create this safe, very safe place to be able to support our 
clients to be able to to open up. Um, so in that contracting piece, and, and we always share, you know, spend time in this place because you're going to be starting to build trust and rapport. Um, you're going to be able to share, is it, is it, or ask the question, is it okay to express emotions when they come up? Is it okay to explore the emotions when they come up? Is it okay to be uncomfortable and still continue to explore? So. And, and the reason I've come in here, because think, thinking about the work that I've done with the Indigenous women, um, certainly when I did that first coach training with the RISE 2025 group, the group of 16 in 2015, um, it was a very vulnerable space for both myself and for the, and for the women, because uh, I was not Indigenous and there was potentially not by all, but some, there was, who, who is this white woman coming into this, this space? Um, so, and I could feel, I could feel that, that kind of energy coming through. So, so working on that contracting piece, those ways of working at the very, very beginning were key to be able to allow emotions to be able to come up and vulnerability to come up and really adhering to also the ICF core um, principles that uh, the people that we work with are naturally creative, resourceful and whole. And so to hold the space, hold the space, really send that energy as well to the people that we're working with. We believe in you. We, we, we trust that you have the answers inside. So there was lots of space holding lots of silence to be able to allow people to go on a journey inside to process their emotions, process the vulnerability, to be able to then feel safe, to be able to share whatever was coming up for them. So um, I have to say that is one of the most powerful experiences of my life to be in that space of vulnerability for all of us and to be able to also share our emotions. Um, so again, very, grateful to Rachel and uh, and all of the women that I've worked with and, and now the men um, who I know that again you know they they accept they you know they accept me into their community and that that is an, an amazing place to be in so um, yeah and I'm sure I'm sure Yogesh and Jedi have got things to add to that so thank you. Uh, I think that's a very interesting question uh, about whether vulnerability happens you don't have to really consciously be vulnerable to someone, right? You just have to be in touch with yourself and just see what comes to your mind respectfully, okay? Uh, for me, my coaching journey started in my sales job and uh, I was selling technology in three countries. I don't understand technology even today. And the first couple of months, I tried to behave like a smart IT salesperson with my clients and nothing happened. Finally, when I started telling them, you know, I just got tired of acting smart. You can understand it's very tough for me, but I started telling them that, you know, I'm actually not a technology guy. I don't understand technology. I'm basically an HR person. Amazing stuff happened. Some of my clients who are CIOs and CTOs opened their goal sheets to me, KRS, because they wanted to do well on their goals. They said, oh, can you help me uh, with this? Now just imagine as a vendor salesperson, your client opening their goal sheets to you. What more can you want? And I can narrate you amazing experiences of vulnerability. When I sit in a meeting with a client or anywhere for that matter, if I don't understand, I, I say, I don't understand. Initial half of my life was spent in trying to not like this, making very, you know, looking very, trying to look very smart. When I have not understood a word. Today I just say that I have not understood a word and just, and the people help you. When you are vulnerable, you know, people help you. They reach out to you, they help you. And there's a joy when they help you. Why are you depriving people of the joy to help you? Huh? Because when you also get a joy when you get to help somebody, I have given that joy to many people. Uh, you know, uh, just just come out and help. That simple uh, concept of all that. Right. Yeah. So my, my thought process was a little more towards acknowledging it. So uh, often we go through those difficult emotions, but we do not acknowledge it. The moment we acknowledge it, then you can do something about it. That that's the that's yeah. yes. The name name your feeling. What what my what my formula is name your feeling. I'm right now scared. I'm right now completely out of my depth. I'm right now you know 
clueless, mm. actually make these statements. Now, the other person helps you out if you are able to name that feeling. So naming your feeling is extremely important. That, that acknowledgement is beautiful. Right. So uh, how can we tie uh, this up to the democratization? Um, Jedi, over to you, sorry. Yeah, I, I think when we look at um, the sense of how do we tie this and create a greater connection in how we how we deal with daily life, I often say this that real people, um, real stories, real life. So the the reality is for us to first accept ourselves because sometimes we put off a front um, and that's the front that people see or the facade of us, but nobody really quite know who we are on the inside of us. So coaches have one key responsibility and that's our responsibility. So often, oftentimes I always tell coaches, I say, hey, you know, our greatest responsibility, it's our responsibility in the moment of the conversation with the client, how we calibrate to the client's shift in every single moment. So even when we're having conversations with our loved ones, so I, I, someone asked me before, say, Jedi, can we coach someone as young as two years of age? I said, yes. Why? Because coaching is not with the spoken language. It is even in the unspoken language. I remember when my kid was growing up and he was only about 18 months old and he was able to communicate with me, pointing things to me, telling me things. And what I did was I modeled that. I said, then I began to point things to him and we created a connection there. And the, the place of vulnerability, that's when it's, it's what I call the vulnerable, vulnerability spirit. And that's when we say, hey, you know, let's have real conversations today. Let's put away the facade. Let's put away all the fanfare. Let's put away even what I think I want out of this, right? Let's just be in this moment, this present moment, just forgetting everything that's around us. And sometimes just take the moment just to breathe and take the moment just to pause and take the moment just to ruminate upon what we are experiencing. So too often in life, we're going through life or forgetting to, to look left and right, look at the flowers, smell the flowers. So when I hear coaching conversations, and for, for example, at ACC level or PCC level, most coaches are just going, trying to help the client get the outcome, 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 or trying to get the clients to the solutions. But it's not really about the solutions, it's about the solutioning. Sometimes on the journey towards the outcome, we see the beautiful things that's around us. We forget the beautiful flowers, we forget about the beautiful uh, sakuras that are blossoming. We forget about the beautiful droplets of water. We forget about the beautiful rainfall. We forget about that, that, that sound of rain, the smell of rain, the Patrick call. You know, sometimes I say, hey, what are we seeing? What are we hearing? What are we feeling? What are we smelling? What are we tasting this moment? Coaching is then about taste and see all the good that's around us. So sometimes I say, okay, let's pause. Let's just look from all the different perspectives and let's just enjoy this very moment. Sometimes that silence of enjoyment will create that sense of vulnerability and connection. Fantastic. Fantastic. Jedi. And, I, and I just wanted to add as well, uh, Pana, I've added in the, the chat, but for those who are not seeing the chat, it, it is when we create the safe space for our clients to work within, whether client or non-client, to be able to then name the emotions or the, the vulnerability or the fear that's coming up. So, so creating that safe container, as Brené Brown would, would say, Creating that safe container allows us to work in that space to allow those vulnerable emotions, fears to come up. And that's when we can do the work to support our client to look at what's what's here, what's under, what's really underneath this, what's what's really your truth, your real truth here. What's the positive intention of this emotion or this fear or this vulnerability that has shown up? You know, what, what, what is it here to, to teach you or whatever, whatever it may be that the client is looking for. So um, just coming back to your question of naming it. So creating the ability to do that and then working with it by asking all those beautiful questions in the moment, as Jedi was, was also sharing, to allow the client to get present with it so that the, the, the fear that's there is potentially subsides so that again, we can see the wisdom or the client can identify the wisdom that's underneath it. So. Yeah, I love it. You, you know, I, I, I often show coaches, I said, I have a lot of little objects here. You see like this little dolls here. And, and sometimes people ask me, I said, why do you have all these things around you? I said, hey, the, the things that are around us, these little things here, these are, these are communication pieces. And sometimes letting, letting the client enter our world, helping them see that, hey, you know, there's a little part of us that loves this. There's a little part of us that love that. And, and that creates a greater, greater sense of engagement.
Yeah, I, I'd also like to show the one that is on my uh, something that oh, I carry wow. around with me. It's a small cat. Did right. I, okay. Wonderful. Right. Did I talk about the presence and uh, you know? On the lighter side, facilitation and training, uh, facilitation and coaching are similar. So when I have to facilitate a workshop or something, my problem, I'm going to be very honest, when I first heard the word mindfulness, uh, I I spelled it at mind, F-U-L-L. -L. That was always my state of mind. You know, my state of things. I'm, I'm not going to be this saint or, you know, ascetic whose mind is going to be peaceful because my mind is always rumbling with at least 10 things at any point of time. Now, and then mindfulness world started irritating me beyond the point as I started learning my coaching. You know what I do and Jedi, uh, going back to what you said just now, whenever I have a coaching session or I have a facilitation workshop, in fact, in the lockdown, whenever I had a facilitation virtual, my wife saw me managing the washing machine you know, drying the clothes. And she said, where is this discipline coming from? Why do we always see? Is this some kind of a ritual superstition? I said, no, no. When I do something physical, when I do a physical activity, I'm just taking my mind off uh, something. So very simple tact for people like me who are not great in mindfulness. What Jedi said is amazing. You know, experience the surrounding, do something very different physical uh, activity wise. It just cleans up your mind. Because if I sit quiet and try to meditate, my mind becomes full with about 100 things in about two minutes. And that's my problem. So those of you who share the problem like me, just try doing what Jedi said of you know, some kind of a simple physical activity completely distracts you. Works. Yes, thank you so much for that. And it, it is in, in a sense bringing coaching into our daily lives. I think uh, subtly every one of you have communicated that how to how we can bring coaching into our everyday life so there are a lot of questions uh, gauri if you're there could you uh, can we run the q and a for our for our speakers thanks i'm not sure um, so the yes. first question is to jenny jenny uh, uh, people would like to find out that you know um, you've been supporting so many wonderful initiatives and how can actually coaches uh, play a part and be a part of those initiatives That's for Janine, right? Yeah, Janine, yeah. Yeah, Janine, yeah. Um, how can they be a part of those initiatives? I, I think that's what I heard. Yeah. How yes. can people be a part of the initiatives and how can they support uh, this cause? Yes. Um, are you talking about specifically the RISE 2025 or something similar? Uh, Janine, that was uh, one of my questions. This is Surek, by the way, from Singapore. I saw that that was a wonderful thing, RISE 2025. I went into the website. I saw so much happening there. 100,000 people. Is that 1 million? I lost count on the numbers. <laughs> but just wondering with uh, so many coaches here and uh, in Yogesh's terminology, leaders and coaches here, how this group of people can add additional value. I do see that there are programs that uh, you and um, uh, your partner are putting together, but there are people who are willing to give, pay it forward. Yes, yes. How can they contribute? Yeah, it's a great, it's a really great question. And um, what I guess I would suggest at this at this moment is to potentially reach out to to Rachel. And so I'll, I'll put her email in the chat box and, and let her know that people may be <laughs> coming to her um, because her vision really is to uh, empower, in, as I say, Indigenous women uh, and men um, and that's, that's to go beyond, to go beyond just uh, New Zealand, it's to Australia, it's to Asia. Um, we've, we're running a program at the moment which includes a Canadian Indigenous woman. Um, so it is, you know, about her vision is about to go across the world. So I would suggest reaching out to Rachel first and foremost, as she's the, the mastermind behind the, you know, the plan, the, the Kari tree. So, um, so that would be my first th first thought, and of course, reach out to me as well. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. I'll pop my email address in the chat box as well, and I'm happy to connect you with Rachel as well. Um, and I'm just trying to think. I, ha I do have another colleague who works in Canada as well, doing Indigenous work. So she may be someone else who is looking for volunteers. So again, you can. Uh, connect with myself and I'll, I'll support you with those introductions. So thank you for, thank you for asking. Thank you.
Thank you, Janine. And uh, Kedai, this is to you. So in this uh, difficult times when there are things that are changing and uh, hope is the only thing. So how can we as coaches build hope to our near and dear ones? How we can build hope as uh, when we are? To our near and dear ones around us. Oh, okay. So first thing is to understand that hope doesn't disappoint. Um, and coaching is based on the premise of hope. I remember one time watching a very powerful uh, movie and it starts with the letter S and someone asked that man, what does the S stands for? Well, the S, it's hope. That's Superman. And I remember that, that scene very well because most people will say, oh, that's Superman, the S stands for Superman. But, he, but Superman said this, that S represents hope in my, in my, uh, my country, my language, right? And, and I think this, coaching and coaches are built upon the basis of hope. We're giving hope where there's hopelessness, we're giving you know, a light in a place of darkness, we are there to shine the possibilities. And, and sometimes even in the darkest of nights, um, we are there to just hold a space for the client to say, hey, you know what? No matter how dark it gets, the darker it gets, the brighter it becomes. The darkest of nights, even that one small, tiny light becomes the brightest of nights. And often uh, when clients come to us and uh, individuals, community comes to us and say, hey, you know, Jedi, I'm getting confused. I'm, I'm just worried. I'm, I'm not sure what to do, you know, um, and the confusion is just surmounting and it's just pressurizing me. So often I say this, hey, when the pressure increase, when the confusion increase, the opposite is also true. So too often we're looking at one side of the mountain, but we don't realize the other side of the mountain is true as well. Because the, if you want greater breakthroughs, you need to have greater confusion. Because breakthroughs are birth from confusions, right? And, and you know, the, the, if you want greater clarity, that you need to have a moment when you're unclear because that's when clarity is birthed for. So too often we want that result, but we're not willing to go through that process. And so sometimes as in, in the coaching process, we help to hold the space for the client to help encourage them, support them, you know, uh, empower them and to say, hey, you know what? You know, you're one step away, just one step away. And coaching is not helping the person to take the 10, ten steps forward, now, it's helping to take that little one small step, one small step. Too often people want the absolute clarity before they move on, but I tell them, I said, hey, in the coaching process, we're not there to get absolute clarity. If we can see one small step in front of us, let's do it. Let's do it. It's like driving a car in a, in the, in a dense fog, right? The fog is not going to clear until we start taking one step at a time. And that's the beauty of coaching. We can't see the future, and but the future is unlimited possibilities just yesterday we talked about the sense of future right we think about past as a linear future as just one pathway too often people think about the future as one pathway they become very hopeless but when you look at the future and you realize the future is not a singular pathway there are multiple branches and that's when you begin to realize that the future has infinite possibilities uh, just one word of caution to all coaches all of us do want to really work for people especially in current times my sincere request to you is that first take care of yourself. Okay, uh, you know, in a, in a flight also they say that put on your oxygen mask first uh, before helping the others. So as as a, as a coach, as a leader, whatever it is, are you in a space to to help somebody? First take care of yourself. And again, vulnerability. Sorry for repetition. Vulnerability helps to take care of people. I'll give you a very simple example. My mother was not well, and she would always talk about her illness or how is she not doing or something. And the moment I tell her that, you know, mom, today I, uh, I'm also, you know, I, I, I had a slight fever. You should, you could see the shift in her energy and saying that, oh, what happened? How, uh, suddenly the lady who's talking in a very low tone, her tone changes. So you are helping people is two ways. One is to take care of yourself. Second is openly ask for help. And when you ask for, it may sound complicated, but when you ask people to help you, you are actually raising their self-esteem. When, uh, when when you allow them to do that help, it's a wonderful world, actually. Excellent. So is it, we can, we have time for one more question and then uh, uh, we will open up uh, to uh, open networking. But before that, Janine would like to share a prayer that she's received from Rachel. Uh, but before that, we will take a screenshot of all of us um need to capture this moment we had wonderful one and a half hours so uh over with the question and then we will move on i just wanted to say that so people just stay back so that we can take a pic of you 
this is a short question uh, to Yogesh. Yogesh, uh, you already spoke about leaders and coaches, but then uh, in this changing times where the workplaces are changing and there's a lot of change in the workforce as well. So uh, anything specific that leaders need to focus on as coaches? Any top three things that they need to do? Okay. Uh, difficult to say top three, but I'll, 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 I'll give an approach that, that always I have seen working. Uh, first of all, never lose the sight of the big picture. Transactions will go right and wrong. Okay. And especially in current times when the transactions are going wrong, uh, defang, defang the fear. I, I tell you very simply, uh, I'm known to be a temperamental person and I can get angry very quickly. I know I'm no shame in saying that as a coach, but that happens. Now, I have defined my anger when it comes to my kids. Okay, I have told that when you see me angry, there are only two reasons. Either I'm having a low self-esteem or I'm scared of something. Okay, so today my son, when I get angry on him, funnily says, oh, that seems to be low self-esteem. Fine. So the fear of that anger has gone. So I think what leaders need to do is that defang the fear that people may have to you. So give, have communicate as much as you can in terms because you are also a human being. Uh, keep the big picture. Some transactions will go right, some transactions will go wrong. Uh, remember, feedback is a gift that you someone care for, which means it has to be specific, it has to be careful. And, and don't confuse transactions and relationships. Yeah. And if you remember this one simple principle, don't consume, uh, confuse relationships and transactions. Relations will go on, transactions will go up and down. I think if you remember this one thought and the three golden questions I leave them with. Whenever your temper is going up, ask yourself the three questions. What do I really want? What do I want from this relationship? And what do I not want to happen? Uh, you know, centering and all that are big words. But if you ask these three questions to yourself, uh, the centering happens. Uh, you don't need any training for that. It's, it's more an intent than a skill. I hope I've answered. Great. Thanks, Yogesh. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. So what I'm going to do is I won't share the New Zealand or the Maori version of it, but I will share the English version. So embrace the life force of this earth. Embrace the life force of this sky. The life force I've gathered is powerful and shatters all darkness. Come great life force, join it, gather it. It is done. How many? Thank you. That was beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Janine. So uh, thank you so very much, everyone, for your participation. On behalf of the Governing Council and members of ICF Pune chapter, my heartfelt gratitude to you, Janine, Jarai, and Yogesh for sharing your thoughts with us. I would also like to place my hearty thanks to all volunteers and participants who are the force behind making ICW 2021 a grand success.